Welcome to Embedded, the show for people who love gadgets. I'm Elysia White, here with co-host Christopher White, and our guest is Angie Chang, Director of Growth at Hackbright Academy. Hi, Angie. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for reminding me. Could you tell us a bit about yourself? So my name is Angie Chang, and I'm known primarily as the Director of Growth at Hackbright Academy, an engineering school for women in San Francisco. Um, I'm also the founder of Bay Area Girl Geek Dinners, and we've hosted about 70 dinners so far at companies starting at Google and then Facebook, and then we've had a lot of various other dinners in Silicon Valley startups and companies. And in 2006, I was one of the co-founders of Women 2.0, which is a media company that supports women entrepreneurs in high-growth, high-tech startups. It is a pretty interesting resume. You did start out as an engineer, though. Yes. Um, I My first job, I was a web producer on the engineering team at You Send It right after the Ray Series A, and that was my first job out of college. I actually attended college to study English and social welfare at Berkeley. And when I was work when I was in school, I had always been working as a web designer or a web producer or a marketing person. And I had years of experience making websites and working with technology teams to uh, make that happen. So when I graduated, the jobs I was looking at were mainly as secretaries or right or like editors. And the job that really attracted me to a startup was at a, a really early stage company called You Send It. So my first job was as an engineer, and I sat in that engineering team for a little over a year, and I, did, I realized how few women there were in engineering. I was the only woman in twelve guys, and that That's number not that didn't bad of change. A ratio, actually, <laughs> and that number didn't change. Was, but yeah. that was very disheartening for someone coming out of college. And I had taken a few classes in college, and there were a few women here and there in my engineering cl- classes. But I really wanted to see more women, you know, out there. I had gone to the first Silicon Valley New Tech meetup, and I realized the ratio of women. And I also went to um, Y Combinator Startup School in 2006 and realized it was five women and like 200 people in that auditorium. And I was always wondering what would happen if more women were out there going to such events? And what if we got together more often to talk about what we could possibly make. Because I knew my I could make websites, but other people had ideas for really great um, t- businesses or embedded software or other things. And it would just be a really, it, the more potential and more possibilities were, were going to be available if women in tech got together more often. So that's actually how I started Women 2.0, was I kept asking everyone that I met for the first year that I was working where are the other women? Like I, I would meet <laughs> one or two here and there, and I would run over to them and be like, what do you do? And, she, and I'd hope that she would say an engineer or something similar to me. So if she did, I would become her friend immediately, and we would hang out. Um, but there was, it was so, so here, a few and far in between, that I eventually got connected to my co-founders of Women 2.0, and... Um, and we decided to host a Women 2.0 conference in 2006. And what that meant was we just basically took Web 2.0 and asked, where are the women in the Web 2.0? And invited a bunch of them to get together. And the, our first conference was at AOL in 2006. And we invited the female founders, who are also engineers of Mebo, to be on stage, as well as some other women in tech. And we had 100 people show up, and that was, to us, mind-blowing, because we normally don't see that many women together talking about starting companies and um, in tech. And from there, we didn't expect it, but everyone kept asking us, when's the next event? Where's the mailing list? And we had it incorporated. We're like, oh, we should make a website, and we should collect email addresses, <laughs> and we should host more events. So I was, at the time working in Palo Alto and living there in a shared Eichler. So I started opening up my living room for monthly wine and cheese events. And each time we get more and more women coming from all walks of life, product managers at Google, um, early stage entrepreneurs, people working at startups who wanted to start their own. And we gave them a place to come together. And it was just wonderful energy and connections being made. And, um, from there, a lot of people did start companies and c- continue to connect over the years. And it's been really great to see where they've gone. And Women 2.0 has grown since then. We've uh, 
we incorporated and we started um, out as a media company doing one conference a year with this business plan competition of women-led companies. And they would pitch at our conference in front of investors um, seeking capital. And we would also have great speakers teaching women to the different aspects of starting a company, for example, how like how to raise money, how to build a product, um, how to find your first users. And we just saw a huge need for women, a huge amount of interest in what we were doing. And so we did this on the side for years and years until about, I think, 2011 is when we decided to quit our jobs and do it full time. How do you make enough money to do that full time? I mean, I understand doing it on your own and maybe even getting sponsorships for the specific events, which started out small. There was like a one night uh, thing and then it got bigger and bigger until it was a day or two. But how do you, how do you get them not only to fund drinks and an event space, but also your salary? So in the, in the beginning, we just out of our pockets bought two buck chuck and like, you know, a cheese platter and called that a, an event and the costs were very low. Um, at conferences, we can charge uh, money for tickets. And when we looked at what other people were doing, um, we realized that we were pretty much a legitimate media company so that we could host events and make a lot of money off conferences and events by charging for admission, by charging companies to be sponsors. Um, and that way, that would keep the rest of the business afloat. And the rest of the business actually meant the bloggers and the writers. So for years, I was an, a writer and an, the editor-in-chief of Women 2.0, and I would share the stories of women starting up. And I would also bring to light women that were angel investors. I would create top lists of women entrepreneurs and X. So for example, uh, women who are starting food companies, women who, are, who have started successful um, B2B companies, and just by creating these lists, which we actually started as a yearly roundup of women who have done something great, such as um, in the Silicon Valley, great usually means you raised a round of funding. So we, but that's easy to track. So we'd be like, if you raise Series A, or if you raised Angel, or if you launched your product, let us know. We will put it on our blog as a yearly roundup. And you had this huge long list of women's accomplishments. And it was really, it's like circled the internet. Everyone told their friends. Everyone wanted to figure out who they knew that could be added to that list. And it was just watching these efforts really triple um, was really empowering for a lot of people. Yeah, I imagine so. But you did leave Women 2.0. Yeah, so I was at Women 2.0 for a little over seven years, um, and by then we had grown to a staff of about six, and we were doing these conferences that were attracting a thousand women at a time. We were doing really well, and um, I had also started Girl Geek Dinners on the side, and I was doing a lot of dinners in my spare time with companies. And one of the companies that reached out to me was a company called Hackbright Academy that had just started out. They were an engineering school for women. And they were graduating the first class of a dozen women engineers. And they reached out to me and said, we would like to do a Hackbrite Girl Geek dinner. And I said, sure, let's talk. And we made that happen. And at that event, my sister came, and she was a small business owner and project manager of startups. And she was in the audience, and she watched these dozen girls walk across the stage saying things like, I used to be a research scientist, but now I'm a software engineer. I used to be a mechanical engineer, but now I'm a software engineer through Hackbright. And she turned to me and she said, I want to go to Hackbright. And she applied for Hackbright and got in and attended the next session of Hackbright Academy. So I was um, very actively involved in Hackbright since then. I was close friends. I became close friends with the co-founder and CEO, David Phillips. And I was helping him out with various initiatives. I was covering what was going on by writing about them on Women 2.0, and which got syndicated on Forbes. And I helped them get more visibility for what they were doing. And I realized I was spending a lot of my time helping and advising this company. So eventually, I decided to leave Women 2.0 in good hands by hiring other editors and writers and go help this new initiative to get more women in technology, which I thought was very fulfilling because one of the problems that I saw in Women 2.0 was that 
our common quip and our common gripe is that women don't get funded because there's not enough women investors. People don't believe that women can create these next Facebook, next Google companies. And with Hackbright, we are creating more women engineers. We've created 150 in the last two years. And we've done it in an incredibly accelerated pace. The program is three months. And women come out and they get jobs as software engineers at companies like Facebook and Pinterest and SurveyMonkey and Eventbrite. And we're just proving that it doesn't take someone programming from age five. It doesn't take a genius that anyone can start and be successful if they just put a lot of work into it. So I really wanted to create this dialogue and narrative and success stories of women who have been able to really pivot their lives quickly and be successful. And hopefully, eventually, they'll start companies and they'll become CTOs and they'll be directors of engineering. They'll write new programming languages. And that's really the goal that we're doing here. We're really enabling women to see themselves as these creators. What is Hackbright specifically? I mean, we've kind of talked about it, but mm-hmm. it, it's a place in San Francisco Yes, we're an engineering school. We're located by Union but Square. You're not an accredited college. No. Okay. Uh, we, like most quote unquote coding boot camps, are, are emerging technologies, emerging educational uh, facilities. I think of us as, as a post baccalaureate program because we take mostly women who have graduated college, who've been working for a few years or a decade in a previous career. And have decided somewhere along the line that they really didn't want to be doing what they're doing and they wanted to be a software engineer. So we have women that have come out of Goldman Sachs or consulting or or they were working in law or they were high school teachers. And they just along the way, they have maybe friends who are developers who are working at great companies, making great salaries and like doing really fun things. And they're like, I want to do that, too. And we basically gave them a way to, to do that where they didn't have to say, but I didn't get a CS degree, so I can't do that. We're saying, well, now you can, even though you didn't get a CS degree, quickly pivot your career with a bunch of other really talented women um, and do it with a great community of alum that we have created in the last two years. And you you do have very focused course sets, front-end web development, back-end web development, um, things that are learnable in a relatively short m- amount of time. Yes. So our cornerstone um, program is the Engineering Fellowship, which is uh, the three-month full-time intensive program for women. And we've been graduating quarterly classes of 30 women at a time, where they come in together to learn full-stack Python web development. And they start pair programming on day one. They have a team of instructors that teach them during the day at Hackbright. And they spend a lot of the day pairing with each other on various exercises. And that goes on for five weeks. And then for the next five weeks, they work on a personal project of their own of their own interest. And that can be something from writing a web app to writing a compiler to someone wrote a rootkit and is now a security engineer. Um, people have found their way through Hackbrite, and it's really given them the energy and the resources to succeed. And what I do at Hackbright is um, a lot of the business development and also managing our mentorship program. And what we do at Hackbright is we pair each student with three industry mentors who are all software engineers or directors or CTOs. Um, and they are connected with the students and help them through the program by explaining to them what it means to work in the Silicon Valley and helping them with code reviews and helping them with their projects and really guiding them. And I think that that's one of the most important parts of Hackbright is giving them the resources in the industry, such as our staff and their mentors, to really make sure that they succeed because it takes a village. And I realized that there's tons of free online resources like Coursera, Code Academy, and it's absolutely possible to learn a code on your own slowly. And I've known plenty of people who've done that, but we help women do it very quickly. And it's tough to do on your own. Yeah, you I mean, need a lot of motivation that yeah. a lot of yeah. people don't have and um, schools provide that in a different way. Absolutely. We provide a great structure and it's when, once they get in and they are competitive, this kicks in and they work together and they like really want to succeed. And they have this really short timeline of three months. They're going to learn to code, make something awesome, and then go out there and start interviewing. How much contact time like per day? I mean, how intense is the program? Is it 
five hours a day or it is 10 to 6 okay so Monday that's pretty, Friday. pretty good yeah so usually there's an hour of lecture in the morning and then they pair program and then we have an hour of lunch and then they come back for another hour of lectures and they pair program for the rest of the day and we encourage them to go to events at night to learn more about various technologies to kind of just get to know people in the industry so it ends up being a very full day people talk about this as being the hardest time in their life but it's also one of the most rewarding and exciting times of their life and do most of the people who come, most of the women who come, have any science background? Is this the first time they've programmed? So most of the students have a background in, say, project management at a startup, or maybe they're a high school teacher and they taught math, or they have a very deeply analytical background. And often they've taken at least something on Code Academy, or they've started taking some classes at a local community college, and they're like, yes, this is really what I want to do, but I don't know how to make the next step. And if they go on Google and they search around, they realize that there's this thing called like coding boot camps and hack rates, one of those options. And we are the only all women option that's been around for two years, a little over two years now. And then they've seen the track record and the blogs of all the alum that have gone through and they see the different success stories and trajectories of women. And they're super inspired to come to San Francisco and do that themselves. And it's an application process. Yes. Yeah, so we have a free application online and a student and all candidates are put through, um, interviews so they can go up to two interviews long and with the staff and then they're um, granted admission if they make it through that and basically they're screening for and I'm not part of the admissions team so it's hard for me to talk about this but I think they're screened for um, basic like skills um, whether they are had previous success and that's a big indicator of their future success so we often screen them for their ability to get a job after the program because oftentimes if we take someone who's been incredibly successful as a lawyer or someone's been incredibly successful as a lab tech then they can if they put their mind to it they'll easily succeed as a software engineer that makes sense also they screen for um, how much we want to spend all day with them for three months it's <laughs> right. also a likability <laughs> screening so it's almost like interfering for a job in some sense. Yes, I mean, most schools don't. It's screen similar for that. Yeah. to how startups say we hire no jerks. Right. We screen for people that we want to be with for three months. And do people get hired out of the program? I mean, you you work with companies as part of the program. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so um, right now we are seeing that ninety percent of our graduates get a job offer in the first three months, and their average salary is right now ninety um, k out of the program. Uh, most of them go on to become software engineers. A few of them go on to become support engineers, customer support engineers, product managers. People have kind of done all sorts of things. We've had people go work as a software engineer for a year after Hackbright, and then decide they want to get a master's in computer science and go back to school. Um, I'm still looking forward to the day that one of our graduates starts a company that gets, that gets venture funding. Um, but yeah, they really come to us looking for that career pivot to become a software engineer. And you said you're not part of the admissions team. What, no. You're director of growth, which mm -hmm. means you go out and ask people for money? Yes. Yeah, so I work with partner companies, and these are companies that work closely with Hackbright Academy to uh, support our students and our programming. And we invite all partner companies, and that includes companies like Facebook and Google and New Relic, to our quarterly career day, which is the day where... All our graduating students are speed interviewed by partner companies for their open jobs. And uh, it's a great day. Uh, the last one was held at GitHub, and it was a lot of fun. Um, it was great for the students because they get to talk about what they made. They get to really shine and meet a lot of people very interested in hiring them. And we work closely with the partner companies to make sure that we're teaching the right skills to these students, that when they graduate, these companies can be ready to hire them. And so what do you do? Do you go out? Meet new companies? Yes. So I spend a lot of my time talking with companies and getting them involved with Hackbright. I'm talking to a lot of the larger companies and trying to find the right person at that company. It's pretty difficult um, to find the right person in a big company to create a partnership with Hackbright. But we're working really well with companies like Intuit and Facebook who have been on board with Hackbright. And actually, both of them are sponsoring scholarships for women to attend Hackbright Academy. Oh, how much does it normally cost? So the program is fifteen thousand dollars for three months full time, and that's pretty com that's pretty average for what coding boot camps are today. Um, the scholarships are 
for to help women. So, for example, Facebook has sponsored a scholarship for diversity candidates to attend Hackbright Academy, and Intuit has sponsored a Moms in Tech scholarship. And I'm always talking to companies, asking them to sponsor a scholarship for women. I'm looking for, for example, people to support veterans or for companies to provide more scholarships generally for women. So I'm just out there talking to companies, seeing how we can possibly work together. And the sponsorships are quite expensive. I mean, for the companies, they, they're they're investing a fair amount in this. Yes. Yeah, so we take full full scholarships, which are 15k, but we also take partial scholarships. We have a general scholarship fund that people can contribute to. And also, what I do at Hackbright is I do a lot of the programming, so a lot of the tech talks and field trips, and working with our partner companies to make sure that our students get to go on their campus and meet the right people and really get a feel for the companies. So, for example, we go on field trips to places like Facebook and Intuit. And we had gone to Skybox Imaging earlier this year, which is um, one of the satellite companies, big data imaging companies. And it's a small startup in Mountain View. And we took the students there, and they were kind of a little like, they looked checked out the website, they knew it was a really cool company, but they didn't really have a sense for the company besides its, its website. So it was really interesting for them to be able to go inside the company, hear from the women that work there, get a tour, walk around and meet people. And suddenly everyone was like, I want to work here. And it's been a really great way to get women really excited about companies that they haven't heard of before that don't have really, normally have that that wow factor. So everyone knows about like Facebook and Twitter and Google and they want to work there. But there's companies all over Silicon Valley that don't have that same shine. So we're helping our partner companies gain more visibility with our students. And so places like Skybox Imaging, which was actually uh, acquired by Google, and one of our alumni actually works at Skybox and was there when it was acquired. So we have our first Hackbright alum who's a Googler now by acquisition. And we also go to places like SurveyMonkey, um, which most students kind of think, oh, it's a survey company. Why would I ever want to work there? But actually, SurveyMonkey has a great female CTO, Selena Tobakawala, and she has brought on four or five Hackbright alums who work at SurveyMonkey now, and they are some of the happiest people I've seen. They really love working there. It's a great place. You really don't know till you get there how great this workplace is. So we take our students to SurveyMonkey to meet the engineers, have lunch, talk to people, and suddenly everyone wants to work at SurveyMonkey, which is what I think is great about field trips. Um, we also hopefully go to places like Intuit, which people kind of think of as boring finance software. But in fact, it's one of the great, I think, places for women to be at. I've actually went to Intuit for a Girl Geek dinner, and I met a lot of the engineers there, and I thought the the, the place was, their, their campus is great. And the people there are really passionate and really smart, and it seems that I, I want to provide these opportunities to our engineering fellows. So that's what I do um, with the field trips is to get our students to various companies that they normally don't think of, but are actually really great places for them to be at. And then I also organize hackathons and we have qu quarterly hackathons. And right now I'm working on our hardware hackathon, which is happening at the end of September. It's September 27th and 28th in San Francisco. And we are be we are going to have 150 to 200 women hacking at Stripe and they will be building um, whatever they want to. We're basically giving them hardware boxes. They're going to be getting inventors kits and electric imp dev kits and random boards that people are bringing. And we're bringing tons of mentors together and tons of women who are really excited to meet other women hackers and just build something over the weekend. Well, I'm, that was actually next on my list to ask you about. So I'm, I'm happy we're, we're headed that direction. So there are going to be women who come and they're hacking on hardware, which is very cool. And Electric Imp gave him kits. And you said inventor boxes. Are those the spark fun? Yes. Uh, do you remember what's in those? Um, there are various sensors and an Arduino. And women are just going to have a blank canvas. They can work on whatever they want. Yes. Yeah, so we're encouraging people to form teams on Hackathon.io beforehand so they can kind of float ideas about what they want to do and get excited about it. I think one of the things that is problematic about hackathons is there's a there's a high rate of dropout after the first few hours where people, especially women or people who it's their first time at a hackathon, walk in and they see the giant mess of people and they don't connect with anyone or they don't have something they really want to work on and then they'll leave. 
So we're trying to discourage that by having women sign up on Hackathon.io and look at the various projects being pitched by their peers. They can pitch their own project and they can form teams online. And we're also going to let them form teams in the first few hours on Saturday when they can mix over breakfast and coffee and just meet each other and hear about what they're thinking about doing and trying to join a team or start a team. And then they will learn about what's in their kit. Mm -hmm. I mean, because most of them will not have any hardware experience? Yes. And we are also hosting a workshop at Hackbrate the Tuesday before the hackathon, which will be an intro to Arduino workshop. That'll be fun. Yeah. Um, is that free or is that pay for? It is free. The hackathon is also free. Right. It is. It's free to all attendees. Mm -hmm. And uh, any woman can sign up. Is there any requirements about their skill level or their background? So we are beginner friendly and we are very explicit in our in our verbiage that we're like beginners are welcome because we will have experienced mentors and program and everyone will be very friendly and inclusive. So feel free to come if you don't know anything about programming. You'll probably join a team and learn a lot just by being there. And you do have some mentors. We have a lot of mentors and we're always looking for more. Anyone with breadboard experience or hardware or software experience can come and be a mentor. And we they can mentor for four hours at a time or they can even come and commit their entire weekend and really be a mentor for one team throughout the weekend. And I know you've got some of the Electric Imp guys coming. Yes, Electric Imp is coming and they're bringing their dev kit. So there'll definitely be someone there to help with that. So mentors don't have to be women. No. So our hackers are mostly women. We've been encouraging that. And the mentors can be uh, any gender. Anybody who's willing to encourage people. Yes. Cool. Are you looking for more mentors still? We are looking for mentors. We can always use more mentors. And so it, it's a four-hour time commitment or the two days? Yes. And the can. two days isn't... I, I, I hear about these hackathons that go all night. This isn't like that. No, I think we start at 10 and we end at about 8. And we're like, go home, go sleep, go have dinner somewhere. I think there were notes that you could start a little earlier on Sunday getting coffee with your team. But it's still a reasonable number of hours. Yes, we, especially at Hackbird Academy, we really stress having work and life balance. No, we really don't want people to be working all the time. And we don't want anyone to burn out. We want people to have a good time and continue building and want to do things like hackathons in the future. And will people, will mentors and attendees walk away with goodies? What's What about the boxes? What's happening with them? So each, the teams that are building, they will be able to take their box home. Well, the teams will have between five to seven people. So unfortunately, it's one box per team and someone will get to take that home with them. Well, maybe two people if you mm -hmm. get the adventure box and the Arduino. Yes. But you have lots of prizes. Yes, we have various prizes that have been donated. And thank you. You actually also helped donate um, some copies of your book. Thank you very much for that. O'Reilly actually did that. And we did. I donated seven uh, books for a winning team. Mm -hmm. But winning doesn't... You, you let me choose. I, 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 voted, I want it to go to a team that is most likely to do this professionally. Yes. So we have prizes that are like most creative, best use of X. And we were just kind of, we want it to be a fun experience. It's not one of those hackathons where you come in and you're like, I'm going to win a million dollars and it's going to be very competitive and people are going to cheat. We want people to come and have a good time. And therefore our prizes reflect the attitude of we're having a good time. So we're going to give some fun prizes out and hopefully everyone will walk away with a little something. Well, in addition to the books, um, my company, which I guess sponsors the podcast. Please don't ask us to work for you. That's not an ad. Um, but our company is also uh, giving you seven fifty dollar gift certificates to Spark Fun to go along with the books. Yes. So that will be fun. And I, I how are you going to choose the winners based on somewhat nebulous criteria? We have a panel of judges that we're assembling right now. I have Pamela Fox confirmed to come, and I'm working on the rest of the judging panel. But they will help pick. So it's not, it will be somewhat of a judicious process. I think that will be fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and sponsorships. You are looking for uh, more money from big sponsors. Is it 2500 was the silver level sponsor? So actually, we actually, I think we're doing pretty okay with the fundraising at this point. Autodesk has uh, stepped in as platinum sponsor. Salesforce has stepped up as the gold sponsor. And we have Amazon Lab 126 as a silver sponsor. So in terms of like 
funding the, the hackathon. I think we've met really great partners in the community who have been very supportive of us. And Autodesk and, Sal- and Salesforce and Amazon Lab126 are frequently sponsoring Hackbrite Hackathon. So it's been really great to have them on board for this one as well. Oh, good. I'm glad. And yeah. so maybe there'll be t-shirts and goodies. Absolutely. We, we always make fun t-shirts. Um, I was a bit nervous in August, um, but after Labor Day, everyone came through and was like, well, yes, of course we're sponsoring your hackathon. So I was like, as a hackathon organizer, I felt very glad. I was like, thank you so much for realizing the value of hundreds, hundreds of women hacking together. So yeah, they're great supporters. Cool. Are you still looking for uh, speakers? And if so, what are you looking for? So... Right now, I think we are good on speakers. We have Julia Grace who will be speaking about hardware and software, and she's the head of engineering at Tindy. And we have one of the HackBrain instructors, Nick Avdrinos, who will be explaining what's in the box. Um, so I think in terms of speakers, we'll be, we'll be set. I'm actually wondering, and this is kind of because it's an ongoing conversation of what's going to happen at this hackathon, if we could do some kind of unconference where we have various speakers sign up to give a talk in a side room so people can elect to maybe learn about something for an hour at the hackathon. Um, but that's kind of an ongoing conversation we're having about how we can possibly make this hackathon more enriching. It's tough because then you have to get more speakers. Yes, we're adding complication to a, the hackathon, which is why we're still wondering what's gonna, if that's actually going to happen. It takes a lot of organization to make this happen. Mm-hmm. And there's, I mean, there's the site and the food and the boxes and, but what about the other side? What, what should I expect if I'm coming? I've only been to one hackathon and it was, I was one of the people who left after a few hours because it was <laughs> impenetrable and pretty boring. Right. So I think one of the things I've learned about organizing a lot of hackathons and I've organized startup weekends for women 2.0 and I've organized hackathons at Hack Fright is that you just have to make sure, especially for these women-focused hackathons, that our staff is very acutely aware and greets people and makes sure that anyone that looks maybe a little lost or a little hesitant is brought into the fold and that they're introduced to a team, that they're talked to, that we make sure that they feel like they're part of it. Because sometimes at the larger hackathons, it's too easy to like be at the sidelines and to be ignored. And you're like, well, if I just ghost, no one will realize it. And then you do. So... We work really hard to make everyone feel very comfortable. Our space um, that we post at hackathons at has always been very comfortable. We, the women, I think there's something really magical about having an all women's or mostly women's space is that people are super excited to see each other because normally as an engineer, you don't get to work with all that many women. So when you see like 100 of them together at a time, who are all really excited to be there and to work together and to meet each other. Um, it's just a really great experience. Cool. And that part where you introduce people and connect them. Mm -hmm. That's something that's been uh, thematic through your career. You've been somebody who generally is a connector. Right. I think it's really fun and easy to connect people because I always meet people that I think are really interesting and really great. And I'm like, oh, you should really meet this person. And it's really a simple thing to write an email intro to be like, hey, you two should meet and just like create these connections between people I personally really enjoy. And the reason why I started Girl Geek Dinners is because I had met um, various people and I decided I want I would love to put them on stage. And I had met at the time Leah Culver. I had met uh, Sir, I had met an entrepreneur. I'd met a VC and I, I met all these people and I was like, they really should be on stage. And I think a Girl Geek Dinner might be a good way to do that by having a company like Google. And Google had actually hosted Girl Geek Dinners in London. And they every time you put a speaker on stage, and a lot of times some of these women are not the people you normally see on stage, but when you ask them and you're persistent, then they'll say, sure, I, I guess I'll speak. So I had actually met their director of user experience uh, at Google at the time, Irene Ao, um, and I asked her, and I was like talking to her, like, you're so amazing and inspiring. I think you should, can you, would you speak at a Girl Geek dinner? And she's like, um, yeah, I guess so. And I went to Google and in 2007 and said, so would you sponsor a Girl Geek Dinner? Um, you guys sponsor them in London. And I have these amazing five women I want to put on stage on a panel. Can you host that? And they said, sure. And it turned out to be a 400 women event with a large white tent outside. And we took over Charlie's Cafe. And it was like, a. I think for anyone that attended that event, it, it's very memorable to them because it's one of the first times you see outside of Grace Hopper that many women together. 
and t- with an amazing assortment of women on stage talking about their experiences and not and they're talking about what it's like to be doing what they're doing. They're all completely different, but all amazing people. And we didn't really talk about any work life issues on the panel, and that question only came in the Q and A afterwards. So we have a couple of terms we haven't defined, and I, I, Girl Geek Dinner is one of them. So, that, but Grace Hopper is the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing, and that's an annual conference uh, put on by the Anita Borg uh, Institute. And it's several hundred women all across computer science, no particular area, but academic students, professionals. And it is more about computer science than you might expect, and less about women in tech issues, work-life balance sorts of things. Yes, Although so that comes up. Grace Hopper is very, um, It is they do target a lot of computer science undergraduates and graduates. And it is very industry, it's actually, I think they reach thousands and thousands of people now. Um, it's very popular. Um, it's a very popular event. It sells out usually. Absolutely. I know I've heard like companies who are sending like 100 people to them because yeah. it's a great recruiting event. Well, at one time, ShotSpotter... We sent all but one woman who worked for us in f- that year, and since it, we were only like, since there were only like six women in the company, it wasn't that many. But it was uh, somebody noted that we probably sent the highest percentage. <laughs> and yeah, it, it's amazing. And and that time we talked about how ShotSpotter worked, so it, it was pretty technical. Yes, as well as being. Fun. It was it's really a lot of fun. fun. <laughs> yes, I remember the parties at the, like the final day parties are always tons of fun. And not to to go too far into the stereotype, I like that many of the menus involve salad and cake, and that seems <laughs> to be what meals are made out of. <laughs> that might have been my San Diego perception. That one was one of the last truly wild ones. Uh, the last one I went to was in Baltimore, and that was a lot of fun too. I remember dancing with like a, like hundreds of women, uh, all engineers, um, to some fun songs outside. And more men have been going to that conference, but they talk about how alienating it is, which I find hilarious. I think they're finally seeing what it's like to be a woman in tech, um, and having to go to bathrooms that are like two miles away because all the bathrooms are closed to men. That was pretty hilarious. But at least the line's probably short for the men. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's a bit like the revert. It's like kind of um, the opposite of the workforce, where like usually when I go to like August Capital parties or something, the Silicon Valley, the like the line for the men's room is so long. But when you go to Grace Hopper, the line for the women's room is so long. Yes, and they close many of the men's bathrooms so they can yes. use those. I think it's Grace Hopper is a great place for um, male executives in tech to go to to see really like kind of feel what it's like to be a woman every day and to kind of hear the stories and like meet really talented women. And it's, I, I know a fair amount of like men who do go to Grace Hopper because their female coworkers say, Hey, you should really go and be like a champion or an advocate for women. It's a great opportunity to do that by going. Yeah. I, I do. And then it's fun to talk to them when they come back, but girl geek dinners and that, and I've been to a few of these, they are, pretty lavish affairs that involve dinner and uh, a technical talk. Although usually dinner and networking is three hours and the talk is one or or it's a 25% of... Which Girl Geek dinners have you been to? I went to one at Microsoft. Um, I went to one that I don't really remember. And then I went to the one last spring at... Um, the Santa Clara Convention Center when the hardware conference was there with Karen Fields. Yeah, so Girl Geek Dinners are a really, it's kind of like a mini Grace Hopper for many companies where they get to really be creative and think about how they can market themselves to women. So for example, Box has hosted a few Girl Geek Dinners and they decided they want to make blue nail polish and like other things. Or when Microsoft had hosted a Girl Geek Dinner, they brought out cake pops. Um, and when Yahoo hosts, they decide to bring out chocolate fountains and like a cake in the shape of a laptop. So it's really a great time for companies to really be have, like have fun in organizing an event and think about all the you know here in the Silicon Valley, everyone has a like some kind of food requirement. So then they have to think about all the vegan oh, yeah. <laughs> options, and then they have to think about how can I make this fun. And they really get to like, for example, at Survey Monkey last week, she had um, the. Uh, the organizer had brought out um, 
marshmallows and even had a little fire for people to roast marshmallows, as well as vegan friendly food options. And it's, you, you work very hard to get good speakers, but that networking time is so fun. And personally, I have a hard time networking. Um, now that I have the podcast, it's a little easier because it's, I walk up to people and say, I have a podcast and then we can talk about that. But if I'm not talking about the podcast, it's, I, I tend to be the person who stands there going, ah, so many people, so many people. It's always, I think people come to networking events because they have a, a something, a mission in mind oftentimes. Something to pitch, a startup to pitch, a job that they want. Absolutely. And that's, that's perfectly fine. And that's actually great because those are the people who are going out to events and talking to people with, like, you know, with an interest. And I think it is absolutely okay to come with your, yourself in mind, whether you want a job or you want to meet someone to be in your podcast or whether you want to meet co-founders or whether you want to, you know, just meet poor people in your industry. Like, it is perfectly okay and great to go out and talk to people about that stuff. And I think I'm really happy that people come out. Um, otherwise, I know there's tons of women working in tech and I never see them. Well, and people do come out. Uh, the Girl Geek dinners used to be you had to sign up and then you had to sign up early and now it's a lottery system because so many people sign up? Yes. Yeah, so we've gone a long way. Um, in 2008, when we did the, girl, the Google Girl Geek Dinner, and that was our first event, we had 400 people sign up in five days. And yeah. that was the first event. And that was by word of mouth. And now we have um, so many events, and each one has like 800 to 2,000 women that apply for the lottery. And if we didn't use the lottery, we would fill up 100 to 400 seats in a matter of two to 10 minutes. So given that, um, we have decided to move to a lottery system so we could be a little more fair about how we give out tickets. I was glad because I I never managed to sign up on anything on time. But, right. um, but it is tough because then you don't really know if you're going. Right. Um, we sent out confirmations. We can do a better job. This is actually something we do on our on the side as our side project. So it kind of falls by the wayside sometimes. Um, but we work our hardest to let people come. And if they really email us really interested in coming, we usually let them in. So for example, sometimes we get emails like the day before, like, I just found out about this. This is perfect for my career. We're like, sure, we'll add you to the list. We really do want to accommodate for people that really want to be there. But it's also easy to sign up for all of them. And go to all of them and get bored by them. So I, I think the lottery works. You also take volunteers sometimes. Sometimes we have people that take pictures, take videos, blog about it, which I think is great because an event only hosts a few hundred people and it'll be wonderful to have like all the videos from all the talks archived somewhere online, ideally for anyone anywhere to learn about it. And it'll like me, sometimes I, I'm at a Girl Geek dinner, for example, the recent one with Megan Smith and um, Danae, the Indiegogo uh, founder. And Megan Smith was at the time the Google X VP and now she's the CTO of the United States. And they had a fireside chat on stage at Indiegogo. And when I say on stage, they literally stood on a, a pallet or a crate and they're like, yes, this is our stage and we're standing here. We're going to have this conversation and share our thoughts thoughts to women in tech. And it was kind of casual 20 minute conversation. And I was like, this is so great. I wish other people could hear this. And luckily, we had a volunteer who recorded the entire thing. So things like that, we can always use more volunteers who have the ability to, the, to do that to help us with that. So the next Girl Geek dinner will be at Pandora on September 25th. And then we're gonna have some talks from various Girl Geeks there. And, and I think we'll actually get that recorded as well. And that's uh, Bay Area Girl Geek Dinner. If people Google for that, they'll be able yes, to find it. Yes, BayAreaGirlGeekDinners.com. And back to the networking thing, I really think there is a lot to be said that still needs to be said about objects, objectives of women when they come out to networking um, events. And I also don't really think of them as networking events. I have a tendency to despise networking events. And I like to think of them as really fun events. And I like, I like to reframe events in my head. So for example, when I look at a cocktail reception with like Sheryl Sandberg and I was like, oh my God, I don't know what to say to her. But then I had to spend some time thinking about like, what would I want to tell her? Like what, I can stand in front of her and just babble and be like, I think your book is great and you're amazing. But I wanted to figure out how to add some value to her and like, what would I want to express to her? And I think this type of, um, Thoughts might be hard for some women to be able to like, it's so hard to talk about ourselves most of the time that we like to talk about other people. We like to talk about the thing we're doing and how 
it's like when women lead, how we often um, don't just talk about ourselves, but we often say, and my teammate did this, and my other person did this. And we're often about bringing others to the front. And I think I do that as well. Like, I don't do these events because I'm on stage. I do these events because I want these amazing Girl Geeks to always be on stage. And the only reason I, w- I go on stage at the beginning of Girl Geek dinners is because my friends, after a while, when I was silently organizing these events and making them happen, they would get mad at me because they would not see me on stage. And like, you have to be on stage and you have to say hi. So I learned to like assume the position and be like, yes, I'm going to give a, a hello. And it's usually literally two sentences long. And then I'm going to quickly hand the mic over. But I think it's hard for a lot of women and even myself to spend time talking about myself. So for example, I was I, I was supposed to go to reception last week with Cheryl Sandberg there. And I was like totally nervous. I didn't know. I was trying to think of how to cue up my conversation for this quote networking event. But then I thought about all the things I wanted her to help with, like, what would I want her to do and how can I possibly phrase that? And then it took a lot of effort. And then I wound up being in my Uber X for half an hour and never made the reception. So all that for naught. So I think there's some advice there for people on how to do, well, we're going to have to call it networking. So I have another, (laughs) how to go to parties and not hide in the corner. I think it helps to have a goal in mind, whether it's your personal career advancement or the career advancement of your peers. Like I often know people that are looking for something, like my sister is looking for a job or my friend is looking for a developer or another person I met last week is looking for angel investment. So there's all these wants um, that are happening that you know about. So if you go into a situation, you can kind of assess what other people have and kind of see if you can make a connection and I, maybe that's my personality. I think a lot of people have that as well, the ability to connect people. Um, and then just go to events with that in mind um, or go to an event. And even though you feel terribly awkward, swear to yourself, like, well, I've already you know, made the trek out here. I'm going to stick it out for an hour and learn something. And that's actually what I did. Um, I went to a hardware hack night um, that was held by Tesla, a te- technical machine. And I had never hacked on hardware before. And my three female friends who were supposed to go all flaked. And I was by myself in a room full of people that looked like they knew what they were doing. And I had this idea of like turning around and leaving. And I stood there and I was like, no, I don't, I shouldn't do that. Like, and I sat and I struggled for a few minutes and I finally said, okay, I'm going to stay here for an hour. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to talk to one of the people that work here and I'm going to have them help me make something. Um, even as a beginner. So I did that. I actually sat down. I found a co-founder. She's really great. And I sat next to her and I talked to her and I was like, hi, um, are you a co-founder? And I'd asked her about herself and I talked about myself and I said, so can I, can you help me make something tonight? And she's like, yeah. And so we sat down for an hour and she helped me um, install everything and get something running. And I got lights blinking on the little chip and it was great. And then I was really glad I stayed and I could, and I tweeted a picture of us that I had taken with her camera that we had installed, we had plugged into the little chip and it was like a success. But there was actually half, like first five minutes I was standing there, I was like, I I need to leave, I need to leave. But I and actually like, you know, fought against it and I was like, I actually came out here, I'm going to stay here for an hour and then I could leave and learn something. It's great advice for anybody, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it, it, setting goals, and asking for help. Oh, asking Excellent. for help is a surprisingly good way to meet people. It was so hard. Like, I didn't know who to ask, but I saw one of the co-founders um, sitting in a corner on a couch by herself. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go sit next to her. might have felt exactly the same. Yeah, you forget that everyone, a lot of people in this industry, and women especially, often feel isolated, even though whatever position they're in, it's, it's, you know, so. Yes. If she wasn't sitting by herself, I would like, how do I enter the circle? There were like groups working together oh, quietly. Yeah. And I was like, how do I enter that? And and finding another solo person or or another pair, you can often break into a pair that's easier. Yes, and then I, when I was hanging out there, my um, my girl geek dinners uh, managing director, her husband walked up to me. I was like, "Oh, it's my first hardware hackathon too." And I was like, "Oh, cool. We're both newbies." And to me, he was like a reputable data scientist, but he was all, it was also his first time, and he was completely new at it. So I felt like we were all in the same boat together. Well, that's, I mean, there's, there's asking for help. There's having a goal and making sure you kind of understand your goal. And, and I find something you do naturally, but I do it consciously. And that's the connections. The, have you met my friend? Even if I have only met this person a second ago, 
and and I have heard their you know their little elevator blip of I'm so and so from here doing this. I liked kittens, whatever. And now I can turn over to this other person who looks lost and and alone and say, "Have you met my friend? Do you like kittens?" And suddenly this connection. Uh, now they're connected and they both like me more because I did something, but I didn't really. Um, so that, that have you met thing, it's better if you find people who are likely to connect and really want to connect. But you know, that first awkward 10 minutes, the way you build a group around yourself is to connect them to each other. And then you quietly duck away and go and sit on the couch. Yes. <laughs> I'm not much of a talker. So you like to connect people. I'm like, good, you guys are talking, then I can escape. <laughs> Then it can escape. I've done my job. <laughs> Where do you see Hackbright in five years? I hope that we'll be something like the most reputable engineering school for women in the country. So, like, if we can become like the next Harvard for women's engineering, or Barnard, or one of those women's colleges that has like a distinguished reputation and I'm not sure where the future lies in accreditation for these programs but I do think there'll be some way to give coding schools more legitimacy in the government's eyes Um, maybe then the GI Bill can apply to us which I feel like it should Um, I think we will hopefully expand and be able to boast really distinguished alum so sometimes I look at the alum lists of various great women's colleges. I'm like, oh, that person went there, that person went there. I want us to one day be able to say, oh, this, the CTO of this company came from Hackbright, and she's giving back. And I want us to be known as the best and most powerful alumni network there is. And all the women that are you know, out there are somehow like in the Hackbright network or have mentored at Hackbright or work with Hackbright. So we, I, we have tons of mentors and we're going to be looking for tons more um, who are men and women who really mentor other students. And I think being part of the Hackbright network is just really saying that we want to change the ratio of women in engineering. And that's a prevalent problem in engineering and many other industries. But we, I think, like to think that we're part of the solution, that we are like the next generation and that we're going to be the change that we want to see in the world. And if people want to be a mentor at Hackbright, what should they do? So they should go to our website. It's hackbrightacademy.com. And if they go to hackbrightacademy.com slash mentor, they can fill out the form there. And um, basically, the, we just ask that you are a software engineer that wants to give back. It's an hour a week commitment for a few months. And to meet your mentee, to come to Hackbright to learn about what it takes to be a mentor. And it's mostly like... Um, just basic guidelines of how, to help. if you've ever mentored, it's um, it's something that's really hard to do until you've actually done it. Like you can think objectively, like I'm going to give wisdom to this person, but it's a lot of actually just listening and meeting people where they are and making them feel comfortable and um, being encouraging. So, and then slowly bringing in your knowledge and your resources when avail- when possible. Do you have any advice for men who want to support women in tech? In general, not not through Hackabrite. Maybe they're not local or, or that's not the right venue for them. But how do, what advice do you have? We have a lot of people that reach out to us that offer um, their, their um, expertise. So whether they want to give a workshop in um, how to whiteboard, um, people have also done really great things. So for example, I was blown away a few days ago when I saw that someone had... Um, submitted a pull request on GitHub to change um, the gendered pronouns in documentation in open source in a very popular open source project. And um, I was like, wow, I really love to see, you know, people really advocating for change in the community. Um, And uh, that was a great example of someone that I would love to give kudos to for being supportive of making technology and this space more inclusive to everyone. Um, there are a fair amount of men that work with women that are able to be their sponsors. So, for example, after um, someone mentors a woman at Hackbright, we often have these CTOs and directors who then know of how talented and how quickly someone can become a software engineer, and they go and they turn around and they talk to their company, they talk to their peers, 
and they actively recruit from our graduates and they actively search for more um, female talent to to join their companies. And sometimes these companies are um, maybe like a five guys, maybe they're 20 guys, but then they really want to, you know, include women in their engineering team. So they come to us or they come to someone or they actually talk to women when they go to meetups and they try to bring them into their communities and into their companies. And I think that's one way people can help is by recognizing that what they have um, could be better if they included more women and um, diversity into their company and into, into their teams. And if they have the ability to go to a meetup and talk to the woman there and bring them in, I often find that they can actually start changing the ratio within their own companies. And like my friend who is a self-taught engineer in LA, she went to um, some dev meetups and was learning on the side and she would become friends with some of the, the people in her meetup and they eventually invited her to their office for lunch and that turned into a job interview and then she got the offer as a web developer. And I think that the, for all those men out there who have gone to meetups and seen women there and try to talk to them and be inclusive and try to get them help or get them an interview, those are like kind of like the silent champions. Do you do uh, any follow-up or have plans to follow graduates over time to see, okay, they stuck with it, um, they're still in tech, you know, two years, five years, ten years down the line? Yes. So right now we're still really early. We're two years in. So yeah. we're right now it's tracking for uh, people who are working or have been working for about a year and a half now. So some people have risen and have gone on to more engineering management positions. And some people have started um, small companies that are looking for funding. And people are working at companies like Facebook and in their engineering teams and doing really well. So I think we will. time will show where they go. Um, I'm going to have to wait a few more years to be able to talk more definitively on that. But you are tracking. Yes. I, I reckon we do track all our people. There's not that many. So yeah. it's easy still. Yes. I can still recognize everyone by face and I know other names. That'll change soon. Um, so I think we're about out of time. Do you have any more questions, Christopher? Uh, I just, uh, I did have one question regarding kind of the, the focus of, of Hackbright. You mentioned that trying to encourage more women founders, which I think is. Um, one axis of, of changing the, the scenario. And then there's the other axis of encouraging existing founders of big companies to, to hire more women. Um, I just read an article from Peter Thiel, who was on the first side. He says, well, to solve this problem, we need more women founders. Uh, and then I saw a follow-up article by somebody else. I have to put the link in. Um, I don't remember her name exactly because I just read it. But um, that said, well, that kind of lets men off the hook. The existing uh, executives and men. And so it's kind of a, a two pronged problem. You have to generate more interest from women and get them into higher positions and get them to, to form more companies, but also get the existing infrastructure to. So, how do, how do you kind of yeah, strike that done, balance? You've done both. Yeah, yeah. So, I think with all that I do with Women 2.0, uh, which I have left, but I trust that they're doing a really good job of educating women entrepreneurs and helping them get funding. There's like Grogi Dinners, which is, I think, a retention mechanism in a way because people often feel burned out on their job and people might not um, recognize it. Their company might not recognize it. So when they come to Grogi Dinner, they feel refreshed and they feel energized and they get to make friends and they get to make friends to go with them to the big idea brunch that they're going to have together the weekend and they're going to hopefully start companies or like help each other out, be moral support for that everyday grind. And then with Hackbright, what we're doing is creating more women engineers that will hopefully give women-led companies um, more clout when they look for funding. So one of the problems with women raising venture capital was that supposedly women are not technical enough and that most companies that get funding have technical founders, which is true or not true, it's arguable. But that's often one of the lines that is given to many Silicon Valley startups is you're not technical enough. This product is not technical enough. And mm -hmm. if we educate more women to become technical, my hope is that they'll create more companies. And then we'll be able to create change in all these new companies that will go on to be the next Google and Facebook. And hopefully those companies will be great. And at the same time, there needs to be room made at the top by people in power for women to rise. And that's another entire issue that I think companies like Google are working on. And they're not perfect yet, but they're definitely aware of and working on that. How to get more women up the ladder once they're already in the organization. How do we ensure that they don't um, drop out, that people we notice um, when they do. I think 
one of the best practices I've heard was to track internally at large companies which managers successfully uh, promote women. And if you're a manager that promotes women, that you should be given more women and you should be given some kind of bonus or reward for that because you're doing something right. And for those people who don't promote women or don't do a good job with the women in their team, don't give them as many women because obviously something's wrong there and try to check in on that. So there's many best practices and things we can do um, that we can learn from bigger companies. But right now with Hackbright, we're hoping to be the change um, for the future. And as a very small startup, we do what we can to like talk to these big companies and see what they're doing and try to help them. Do you think the VC community needs more education and to change too? Because you mentioned that there's a perception that women founders and, and women in general are not technical enough or the companies they found are not technical enough. The people making that decision must be the, the VC community. We do have some women VCs like Aileen Lee who are doing a great job of kind of making this known amongst their venture investor counterparts. Um, but definitely, I think VC is arguably broken at this point. Yeah. And now it's a matter of all the different ways to fund things and innovations. Um, doing an end run around yeah. <laughs> when you can. Okay. Um, well, any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with, Angie? Um, we're always looking for people to get involved with Hackbrite and for Girl Geek Dinner. So if anyone has any ideas, um, feel free to email me. I'm pretty easy to find online. I'm angiechang at gmail.com. And just send me your ideas or how you want to get involved and we can go from there. I actually think one of the things that I do is I respond to most emails, which people often like, how do you do that? How do you actually accommodate most things? I'm like, you can make time for things. And when you say yes to things, more opportunities come up for you. So, um... I would encourage people to reach out if they have any thoughts um, and if they want to mentor or have any questions at all, just to send me a note. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Angie. Thank you. My guest has been Angie Chang, Director of Growth at Hackbright Academy and founder of Bay Area Girl Geek Dinner. A link for the sign-up for the hackathon is in the show notes or search Silicon Chef Hackathon in Google and you'll find it. You can also find the Girl Geek Dinners the same way. They are a lot of fun. As always, thank you also to Christopher for producing and for co-hosting. Finally, thank you for listening. If you've got comments, suggestions, questions, email us. Show at embedded.fm or hit the contact link on embedded.fm. If you didn't catch Angie's email or you can't find it in Google, which makes me question your skills, go ahead and email us and we will forward it along. A final thought for this week. Hmm. There's a lot of stuff, and I really liked what Angie just said. But I think I think this time Albert Einstein has the winner. And I did check that this is something he really said, not just a quote attributed to him. Einstein said, We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them.